Hello, everyone. Welcome to the workshop, The Role of Nutrition in Long-Term Health After Transplant. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Renee Stubbins. Dr. Stubbins is a senior oncology dietitian for Houston Methodist Cancer Center and an assistant clinical member of the Houston Methodist Research Institute. She is a strong advocate for educating patients and their caregivers on evidence-based nutrition information. She follows patients from pre-transplant through survivorship, acting as a reliable guide during their journey. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Renee Stebbins. Thank you. It is my pleasure to be here today. All right, so these are our learning objectives for today. First, we're going to go over the nutritional needs of recovering hematopoietic recipients in the short term and long term. What constitutes a healthy diet for stem cell transplant recipients? How to determine nutritional value of foods offered in the grocery store? And last but not least, we're going to go over some common myths associated with nutrition and cancer. All right, so let's get started. So nutritional needs during short term during and after transplant. So when I'm talking short term here, we're talking the first, you know, under 100 days of your after the transplant. And there are two types of transplants. All right, we have autologous, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's when we use uh, the patient's own stem cells, which are collected before the conditioning regimen. This is very common in multiple myeloma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and Hodgkin's lymphoma. The other type of transplant is an allogenetic transplant. And what this means is that this is stem cells from a donor who's either fully or closely matched. And this is commonly used in the leukemias, acute and chronic sometimes in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and other marrow diseases such as aplastic anemia and myelodysplastic syndrome. The nutritional care during this process is very personalized. So what that means is that it's really important to be connected with a registered dietitian because everyone has a little bit of different needs during this process. And that first visit is that nutritional assessment, and then we have follow-up visits during the transplant process and afterwards. Sometimes a neutropenic or a low microbial diet would be recommended during those first 100 days. It also might be recommended to be on a higher calorie protein and fluid needs. The transplant process is very energy demanding, so we want to make sure we're getting all that nutrition to help with that healing process. A multivitamin without iron will also be recommended. Now, this is a really important thing to keep in mind because it's we don't want that extra iron in there because sometimes during the transplant process we have to do blood transfusions and we don't want to be iron overloaded. So that's why the multivitamin without iron is recommended. The other thing we want to keep in mind during those first 100 days is graft versus host, host disease, also known as GVHD. There's acute and chronic. We're going to first talk about acute. This is more common in the allogenic transplants and it's actually even more common in the unrelated or unmatched donors. Usually it occurs within the first 100 days and it can manifest in a couple of different ways. It can show up sometimes as a skin rash, sometimes our liver enzymes might be a little bit more elevated, or it might show up in our GI tract. Now the GI tract, believe it or not, starts in the mouth and ends all the way down towards the rectum. And the symptoms of GVHD can look very different. So again, remember I said having that close personal relationship with that dietitian is important because everyone's needs are going to be different during this process. Now, the treatment for GVHD in the acute setting um, is also going to be very personalized. So depending on what's going on, depends on what medications might be prescribed by that um, care team. Medical nutrition therapy, I know it's kind of a broad term, but medical nutrition therapy is just another way of saying a dietitian intervention. And it's different for if you have nausea versus if you have diarrhea um, or you're having abdominal pain. We might ask you to keep a food diary just so we can figure out what's causing the issue. Again, very personalized. And severe cases, now if we need to give the GI tract some rest, we might do what's called total parental nutrition which is known as TPN. 
And this is when we use nutrition through the bloodstream, and that way we give that um, gut some time to rest. Chronic GVHD is after the first 100 days. Now, this is when we become a little bit more concerned for risking of malnutrition. And it's when we have chronic issues such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, anything that's going to affect the appetite, digestion, or absorption of nutrients that where we're going to lose weight unintentionally. That's when we start really getting very proactive and or reactive in some cases. Oral GVHD can sometimes look like you have dry mouth, you might be very sensitive to certain tastes and smells. Um, the GI tract, the intestinal mucosa can have changes. Sometimes there's bile acid malabsorption. A lot of different things can happen, but the good news is, is that with early nutrition intervention, we can manage a lot of these symptoms. In some cases, we might have pulmonary GVHD, which increases metabolic demand. So we're using more energy to breathe, so we're burning more calories than we expected. So that's the short term during um, your short term nutritional needs. Now, okay, what happens after that? What about a year, a couple years afterwards? What is the nutritional needs for that long term transplant? One thing we want to keep in mind is we want healthy bones. Osteoporosis is very common, especially after the first year. But there's good news. We can do something about it. So we want to make sure we're getting adequate calcium and vitamin D. So calcium and vitamin D are very common in dairy products. Now, sometimes when during the transplant process, we become very sensitive to dairy, maybe become lactose intolerant. And that's okay. Now we have a great variety of non-dairy products like almond milk, coconut milk, oat milk, and a lot of these are fortified with calcium and vitamin D. Fatty fish like salmon is also a great source of vitamin D and omega-3, so a lot of benefits there. It's also really important to have that vitamin D level checked. If we do need a supplement, we need to know how much of a supplement we need. And last but not least is weight-bearing muscle strengthening exercises. So weight-bearing means you're carrying extra weight. So this is using free weights or using a strength training machine. And what this does is it puts more weight on your bones, so it's helping making those bones stronger. The other thing we want to look out for is metabolic syndrome. So remember we talked about that GVHD earlier. That GVHD is sometimes one of the medications that is used are steroids. So steroids are good and they're bad. They're good because they, you know, they keep our immune system in check and make sure it doesn't go in overdrive. But they do have consequences and it can affect our metabolism. So metabolic syndrome um, has a pretty high incidence after the first year and five years after the transplant. And it's characterized by high, higher blood pressure, higher blood sugar levels, and um, it usually looks like we it, think about like an apple shape. You have that, you know, kind of extra weight around your midsection. It can also result in abnormal cholesterol levels. But again, good news. We can be proactive with our nutrition, maintaining a healthy weight, keeping in mind those portion sizes, and meal planning. So portion control, an easy way to think about this is think about half of your plate being vegetables, a quarter of it lean protein, and a quarter of it whole grains. Meal planning, yes, it does take time, but studies have shown that planning at your meals will help you make healthier choices. And of course, exercise. It's not only good for the bones, but it's good for your healthy metabolism. The cardiovascular health, increased risk of cardio vascular specific mortality is a real thing. And specifically, cardiovascular diseases such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, and heart failure. If we have extra weight on our body, our heart's working harder. But again, not surprising. Got good news for you guys. You can do something about it. Focusing on plant-based foods, which we'll go into a little bit more later, such as lentils, legumes, cruciferous vegetables, and many more, can help add that much-needed fiber to your diet. Fiber is great for keeping a health, uh, our heart healthy and our metabolism healthy. Now, this does not mean you need to be vegetarian or vegan. It just means we need to eat more plants than animal foods. And if we do choose to have animal foods, focusing on the leaner animal proteins such as chicken and fish. 
Again, watching our portions and planning our healthy meals is going to be an important part here. And last but not least is aerobic exercise. So aerobic exercise is different than what we talked about earlier, using the weights. Aerobic exercise works out our heart. So you do want to check with your doctor before you start any new exercise regimen. All right, so I've given you all this information. Like, okay, how do I be a healthy survivor? So what we're going to change directions here, and we're going to do what I like to call a virtual grocery store tour. This is something that I started doing for our patients here, and it really has been quite successful. So we're going to go ahead and get started. This is my favorite section of the grocery store, the produce section. Now you walk in, you see all these colors, everything's bright, and now that we're going into berry season and soon melon season, you can actually smell the produce. And this is the most important part of the grocery store. Fruits and vegetables are cancer-fighting foods, and it's not like one fruit is better than the other fruit. They're all good for us, and it's important that we have that variety in our diet. You want something of every color, something red, something yellow, something green, something blue. And the reason why is all those different colors are all different antioxidants, and they all protect us in different ways. So when we have all those different colors in our diet, we get this broad spectrum of protection. All right, that's why it's so important to visit this part of the grocery store. All right, so next step is how do we add more fruit to our diet? There's lots of options here, guys. So one of the easiest ways is to start by making smoothies. Fruit is naturally sweet, and we don't usually need um, a lot to add something to it to sweeten it up naturally. Um, it's a great snack in summertime because it helps keep you hydrated, and it also can be used in the winter times to, you know, use dried fruits in your oatmeal um, to just give it that extra fiber and natural sweetness. One of my other favorite suggestions is to keep a fruit bowl at your desk versus a candy bowl. This is something I actually do. I usually keep a couple of oranges, apples, and bananas, and you'd be surprised on how often people stop by just for a quick snack. Now, what about vegetables? Now, vegetables was a little bit, I'll be honest, whenever I start, first started adding vegetables to my diet, it took me a while to get used to it. But, you know, it's all about trying new things and trying and error and figuring out what's going to work for you. One of the ways I found that I like vegetables is by roasting them with some olive oil or some avocado oil, and it brings out the natural flavors. The other t um, kind of tip and trick is you can see down here I have these veggie spirals or rice, um, kind of cauliflower rice. So these are nice, convenient ways. So instead of regular pasta with your, you know, spaghetti, um, instead of spaghetti, you can use the veggie spirals. Or if you're going to do some stir fry, instead of using white rice, using the cauliflower rice. So these are all ways we can add vegetables to our diet. Um, and get that extra antioxidants and extra fiber added. All right, so if you think about a way a grocery store is set up, you usually have your produce section right when you walk in. And then next to that, we have our bakery. So we're going to talk a little bit more about grains. So grains, you know, um, kind of have mixed re you know, results these days. A lot of people are a little bit anti-carbohydrate, but they're still good for us. They have a lot of B vitamins, a lot of fiber, and even protein. And when I talk about grains, I'm not just talking about the bread, but we're also talking about ancient grains. So ancient grains are kind of the new kid on the block. So that's stuff like quinoa or frica or bulgur. If you haven't tried these before, I encourage you to be a little bit adventurous. It cooks just like rice. So it would be one cup of grain to two cups of, you know, liquid. So you can either use a broth or water. And these ancient grains not only have protein, but they also have fiber, and they add some fun texture to your diet. Um, if you're looking at breads or cereals, the fewer the ingredients, the better off we are going to be. That's kind of my rule of thumb. After grains, we're going to kind of shift a little bit more to these plant-based foods. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is plant-based um, proteins such as lentils and legumes. They're a great source of fiber, carbs, and they're economical. Now lentils, um, they have 
brown, green, those are going to be a little bit more sturdier so they go well into like salads, so they're going to kind of hold their texture a little bit more. If you want to make more of a porridge or curry, uh, that's when you would use your red or yellow lentils because they're a little bit softer. Legumes, there's all sorts of legumes out there. You have garbanzo or chickpeas, that's you know kind of used when we make a hummus, black beans, green peas, um, lima or kidney beans. All of these are great options for adding plant-based proteins to your diet and fiber. I wanted to also talk to you guys a little bit more about preparing the beans and lentils. So we want to be mindful of our sodium intake. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with buying canned beans or lentils. I would just recommend that you look for the no salt added label and I would recommend rinsing them after, once you open it. So I usually open my can of beans, pour it into a colander, and run, have run water over it. And a lot of times this is going to get rid of about 50% of that sodium that's in there. Now, if you have a little bit more time or you're feeling a little bit more ambitious, you can always do it kind of the old-fashioned way and do a soak. Um, so what this looks like is if you put your beans in a pot, measure out how much you want to cook, and then you fill the pot up with water, and you want about two inches over the bean level. And soaking the beans, it helps a lot remove the um, the products that give us give us gas, that's those phytic acid and the tannin. So it helps reduce bloating and gas caused by that can sometimes happen when we have beans. Um, and it also makes it a little bit easier overall for our digestion and our body to process it. Um, so those are the two options for when you are preparing your beans. Another great plant-based protein are going to be nuts. So nuts are, are these are going to be are what we will call the healthy fats. So it's a plant-based protein, which means they're high in plant fats, which means that these are going to be higher in unsaturated fats, which means they are healthier for our heart. Um, these make great snacks for on the go. And there's all sorts of varieties you have, and they're all good. I always get patients, and they because they all have different benefits. So kind of like the different fruits and vegetables, all the nuts have different benefits. And actually now you can find nuts who are sprouted. So kind of like what we were doing with the beans, by soaking them, you can buy sprouted nuts. And again, this helps remove that phytic acid, so it makes it a little bit easier on our digestion. Now you do want to be mindful about when you're purchasing nuts because you want to check for any added salt or sugar for flavored nuts. And we'll go into label reading a little bit later. Seeds. So our last plant-based protein is seeds. And the seeds are great because they can be a great source of protein and omega-3s and fiber. And one of my favorite seeds is the chia seed. If you've never had them before, it can be a little different. Um, I've made some great chia pudding, and whenever chia seeds, they they kind of gel up a little bit, so the texture can be a little off-putting the first time you have it. But again, great source of protein, great source of fiber, very nutrient-dense. So they have a great omega-3 profile, which means, which is important because omega-3s are anti-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory means healthier for our hearts. Uh, chia seeds can be used in a wide variety of things, smoothies, hot cereal, or even in overnight oats. All right, so we talked about our plant-based proteins. Now we're going to talk about our animal-based proteins. Red meat also kind of gets a bad rep, but it's, it's, there's some good things about red meat. Um, the American Institute of Cancer Research and the American Cancer Society recommend that we have no more than 18 ounces um, per week, which I still think is pretty generous. To kind of put that in perspective, you'll see that I have a picture of a piece of meat next to a deck of cards. So that's three ounces. Um, so think about having me two to three times a week, and you'll be well with under your limit of the recommended amount. Red meat is a great source of protein, B12, iron, zinc. There's a, you know, a lot of potential good things. Again, moderation is key here. Now, red meat isn't just beef. It's also bison, venison, which is deer, pork, and lamb. And we want to try to, you know, again, focus on those leaner red meats to protect our heart. So think of round, top sirloin, or tenderloin. 
we do want to try to avoid processed meat, such as ham, bacon, salami, and hot dogs and sausage. The question I get asked quite a bit about beef is, you know, what's the difference between conventional, organic, or grass-fed? So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Conventional beef is um, just regular beef that you see in the grocery store. It means that the calf has lived on a pasture for seven to nine months and then transferred to a feedlot. Organic beef does not mean grass-fed. So that's a really important thing to remember. Organic beef means that it was given organic feed and forage and was it given any antibiotics or hormones. Um, the cattle can get preventative care and they can be supplemented with vitamins and minerals as needed. Now, and then kind of vice versa, grass-fed and finished beef does not mean that it's organic. So grass-fed is basically the same thing as conventional beef. So it's kind of a marketing trick. Um, so you, again, you have to be that savvy sh um, shopper. So grass-fed beef, if it just says grass-fed, that just means that the calf was started on grass and then transferred to grain. Now if it says grass-fed and grass-finished, which you can see here, the finish is kind of in small print in that picture I have there to the left, but that means that that cattle ate nothing but grass and foraged for their entire life. Now you can visually see the difference between grass-fed beef and um, regular beef. And the grass-fed beef is going to be higher in omega-3s, it's going to be a little tougher to be honest with you, and it's going to have higher in B vitamins. Now, we all know the price of food is going up, so, you know, it can be very expensive when we're shopping, especially for meat. So I wanted to give you all a couple of economic solutions. So one of my favorite things is to go to my local farmer's markets, and I do encourage you to check out this website. Your local farmers there and getting to know your local farmers and develop a relationship with them um, can be very rewarding. Shopping in season and a lot of times if you talk to, especially like your local meat farmers, they may not have that organic label and they, you know, they might be grass fed, grass finished, but seeing how they take care of their animals or how they take care of their produce and having those um, conversations, a lot of times they're practicing organic practices. They just can't afford the super expensive USDA label. So that's why I think the farmer's markets are fun. Another option is joining a community-supported agriculture. So many local farmer's markets, they, if you aren't able to, if there's not one close to you, can have stuff delivered to your door. So during the pandemic, me and my neighbor used to split, you know, um, produce boxes and meat boxes, and this was just a much more economic choice for us. Last but not least are community gardens. So this is also very rewarding. Um, community gardens usually let you rent out a plot to where you can grow your own produce and um, participate in you know that process and watching something grow from a seed to something you can eat is have has many many rewards and you also get to learn about like what goes in season and why we plant things when we plant all right so we talked about beef now we're going to talk about chickens and eggs all chickens in the USA are cage-free and never given hormones or steroids. So when you see that label at the grocery store, a hormone-free chicken, again, it's just kind of a marketing ploy. Um, it, all chickens are technically hormone-free in the USA. Now, organic chickens and cage-free and free-range are, you know, I, I find it best to kind of explain this using the visual. So that's why I have this picture here to the right. So if you see our um, chicken here that's white, this is a can be a caged or a cage-free. Now caged is exactly what it sounds like. It has a tiny cage that it's in. Uh, cage-free means it might be in a barn, has a little bit more space to walk around, but they're, both of these are very rarely outdoors. Now if you see some that says it's a free-range chicken or free-range eggs, this means that they basically have a door. They can go outside, but they're never guaranteed to go outside. Um, you know, it's kind of up to the chicken's choice, but a lot of times they don't go outside because they've never been outside and they're scared. Um, now we have our brown chicken here. Now the brown chicken is in the pasture and it's just going around doing its chicken thing and, you know, eating what chickens normally eat in the grass. Um, now this is important because wanted to show you all this picture. All right, so if you're looking at this picture, one egg is from a caged chicken, the other one is from a pasture-raised chicken. Now, 
this one on the left is from the caged egg. And it's not like it's a bad egg, you know, it is high in protein. But the pasture raised egg, you see how it's a little more orange? And the reason why it's more orange is because it's higher in protein. I'm sorry, it's high in protein as well, but it's higher in omega-3s. Remember the anti-inflammatory, we want to make sure we have that. It's higher in vitamin D. We need that for our bone health. It's higher in vitamin E and vitamin A. So that's what gives it that nice orange color. All right, so this is a healthier egg. Both eggs are healthy, but the pasture-raised egg is going to be healthier. All right, so now fish. Now, I get a lot of questions about wild-caught versus farm-raised. So wild-caught means that they are captured in their natural habitats, such as ponds, streams, oceans. Um, they have a much more diverse diet, and they're less likely to be contaminated or diseased. However, sometimes damaging techniques are used that can be harmful to the environment, such as drift nets. Farm-raised means that, that the fish consume the same food each day and the diet has less variety. But not all farms are created equal. So this picture of the Monterey Bay Aquarium is a website you can go to depending on where you are in the country or in the world. Um, it can help guide you in making the choice between if it's best to get wild caught or farm raised. And I put this picture here because this is kind of a difference between the wild caught salmon, which is the one on the left. It's a little bit brighter. You can see that it's leaner versus the farm raised salmon is going to be a little fattier. Both are great sources of protein. Both are great sources of omega-3, but the farm race is going to have a little bit more of a fattier profile. Speaking of fats, we're going to talk about oil. So extra virgin olive oil got a lot of attention a couple of years ago, and it's a great oil, but I find that a lot of times um, my patients and caregivers, caregivers and even my loved ones can sometimes use it not correctly. And I put smoke points here, and I wanted to explain to you guys what smoke point means. So smoke point, we don't want to heat an oil above its smoke point. And the reason why, because it turns a healthy fat into an unhealthy fat. So it's best, so olive oil has a low smoke point, and you don't want to go more than 325. So you can do it for a low heat saute, but it's best to use as a finishing oil. So this would be better into salads or let's say you roasted your vegetables and then you wanted to toss them after they came out of the oven and some olive oil for flavoring. Peanut oil is used as a high smoke point, so this is best for frying. And then you have canola oil, which also has a pretty high smoke point, so that's best for baking. Now, if you still want to have like a healthier um, fatty acid profile, which I will explain in a minute, you can use grapeseed or avocado oil. So these have a higher smoke point, and this is often what I use whenever I'm marinating some chicken that I'm going to grill or some vegetables. Coconut oil also has a pretty low smoke point, but it can be used as a non um, cook for baking and non-dairy food items. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the fatty acids. So just a little bit of chemistry here, or biochemistry, I should say. We have polyunsaturated fats. So these are your omega-6 fatty acids and omega-3 fatty acids. So too much omega-6 fatty acids isn't good for us. It promotes a much more inflammatory state. Inflammation is not good for us. And then you have omega-3 fatty acids, which I said a couple of times, these are our anti-inflammatory fatty acids. So these are kind of the good guys for our hearts. So we look over here, we have the linoleic, which is the omega-6, so that's the blue, the alpha-linolenic acid, which is this orange color. So you can go up, okay, this one has the most, and that's your flaxseed oil. So flaxseed um, oil comes from flax seeds, and they are great for omega-3, um, you know, fatty acids. And then we have our monounsaturated fatty acids, so this would be our olive oil. So if we go down here to olive oil, we can see that it's very high in oleic acid. That's why olive oil became so popular, because it was known to be heart healthy. And the reason why it's said to be heart healthy is because it decreases LDL and increases HDL, which is the good cholesterol.
All right, so now we're moving on to the dairy and non-dairy. So as I mentioned earlier, dairy is a, dairy foods are a great source for protein and our calcium and vitamin D. And now we have more non-dairy options available, such as the almond, oat, and coconut milk. You also have yogurt and kefir, which are great sources for probiotics, and they're lower in lactose. So if you are more sensitive to lactose, some of my patients who are lactose sensitive are able to tolerate yogurt and kefir to get those good probiotics. All right, so I talked about label reading, so I just want to spend a few minutes going over label reading. Now this is a label from a strawberry yogurt. And we're gonna start over here at the top left and we're gonna check the serving size. Okay, so one container has um, four servings in it. So for one serving is gonna be 130 calories. Okay, that's okay. It's a good amount of protein, 12 grams. Uh-oh, but there's some added sugar. So we have 18 grams of added sugar. And that's a, that's a pretty good amount. You know, that's nothing to, you know, shy away from. And so let's look at the ingredients. First ingredient is um, non-fat milk. Okay, that makes sense. But the second ingredient is sugar. So the way ingredients labels work is that the it's kind of listed from the most to the least. So that means the first couple ingredients are what makes up the most of the food product. All right, so this means that the second most ingredient in this yogurt is sugar. Now, what about a plain yogurt? All right, so the plain yogurt serving size, okay, is a little bit less calories. So if we're monitoring our weight and we want to be moderate with our sugar intake, this is going to be a healthier choice because this has no sugar added. And we can double check that there's no sugar added by looking at the ingredients, all right? So remember what I talked about the fewer ingredients, the usually it's a healthier product. And so as we can see here, this just has one ingredient mostly. It's just nonfat yogurt. So we're going to shift gears here a little bit, and I'm going to go over some common nutrition myths. So you've heard me say a couple of times I've talked about sugar, I've talked about healthier and healthy food. Um, so I wanted to go over a few questions that I get um, quite a bit in my practice. Myth number one, does sugar feed cancer? First of all, this is an oversimplified statement. One thing I wanna make sure that y'all understand is that sugar feeds your entire body, all right? It feeds your heart, it feeds your brain, it feeds your muscles, and yes, it can feed cancer cells, but we have to have sugar in our diet. That's how our body runs. Our body runs on glucose, aka sugar, all right? And the bottom line is that matters where you get your sugar from. Now, if you're getting your sugar from cupcakes all the time or cookies, not so good, all right, versus if we're getting our sugar from fruits and whole grains. So I always tell people there's sugar that makes us happy, and then there's that sugar that, you know, has benefits. And it's important to find a balance. You know, naturally, we want to have more functional sugar. We want to have sugar with benefits. These are your fruits with those. You have that natural fruit sugar, but you also have the antioxidants and the fiber in there. And that means you know, it's okay to have that occasional sweet, such as a cupcake or a cookie. It doesn't mean that if you have that cupcake or cookie that it goes straight to the cancer cell. It's much more complicated than that. Now, if we have an excess of sugar intake, which leads to empty calories, which leads to weight gain and obesity and you know, all those other chronic diseases, then yeah, we might need, we might need to have a conversation and figure out some um, lifestyle changes. But having that occasional sweet is okay. So the solution, focusing on having a balanced diet. Think moderation, not deprivation. All right, and be, be picky with your sweets. You know, if you're going to have a cookie, make sure it's a good cookie. And make sure that it's the best cookie in the world and that you are enjoying it and let yourself enjoy it. All right, the second myth, organic food, is it healthier? Not necessarily. So studies have found, have not found, I should say, any clinical significant differences between organic foods when it compares to conventional foods. This is a personal decision, but it should be an informed decision. 
organic food does not mean that it's healthier. Now, one of the things that I talked about earlier was shopping at your local farmer's market. So one thing I want you to think about is where your produce is coming from. The way produce works is the longer it stays off the vine, the nutritional value goes down. So if you're going to your local farmer's market and they just picked the produce yesterday, then that produce has only been off the vine for a day. Versus if you're going to a supermarket, it might have come from California, it might have come from Mexico, it might have come from another state, and it, it's been longer off the vine, so it has less nutritional value. So another kind of bonus to shopping at local farmer's markets. And again, consider joining the community-supported agriculture. There's lots of um, produce boxes available that you can purchase that are actually what they would call imperfect. Um, so grocery stores are very picky. They want the prettiest produce. So sometimes produce that's just as good, but maybe has a couple of bruises or maybe it looks a little weird. So grocery stores don't take them. So they've a couple of companies have started up by taking these um, produce and making them more economic solutions for other people to have access to them. So one of these would be called Imperfect Foods. Um, another um, brand is called Misfit Foods. Should I follow an alkaline diet? So first of all, what is the alkaline diet? Um, so the alkaline diet is avoiding foods that increase the acid in your body. And increasing foods that your body's, um, well, that will increase your body's alkalinity or pH. The thing is we really can't change our body's pH. Our body has a natural buffering system. So the alkaline diet, if you really look at it, it's kind of just a healthy diet. Um, you know, it has these foods over here, you know, that are considered more alkaline, but if you look over here, look what's over here. It's fruits, vegetables, water. So it, overall, okay, yeah, it looks like a healthy diet. And the acidic foods are a little bit more processed. So we already kind of know this, right? We, we want to eat more fruits and vegetables because they're just naturally healthy for us, and we need to moderate the foods that are going to be, you know, what they're calling quote-unquote acidic. But the bottom line is that there's not a lot of validity behind the alkaline diet. You can't change your pH. All right, this is our last myth. Can supplements replace a healthy diet? So the first things first, talk to your medical team first. Certain micronutrients can be checked. So we talked about checking your vitamin D level your iron level, B12, and your folate, and your zinc. Supplements do not replace a healthy diet. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, I know supplements, they might make all sorts of claims, and they might say they um, are the equivalent of, you know, five fruits and vegetables in one pill. If it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. And the American Cancer Society put out a statement that I really liked. So I'm going to share that with you. The dietary ingredients and in supplements don't offer the same benefits as eating whole foods. Research has shown that supplements do not offer cancer protection or provide benefits to survivors who are worried about recurrence. So remember in the very beginning, we started in that produce section and talking about those fruits and the vegetables and having something of every color to have all, get all of those antioxidants naturally from food because that is the way our body recognizes it. So that is the best way for our body to get it. And I believe that is my last slide. So I would like to take this time um, to thank you for letting me come and talk with you guys today. I hope the information was informative and helpful to you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Stubbins, for your wonderful presentation. That was a lot of great information. Um, we will now take questions. As, as a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. The first question I have is, what are your thoughts on anti-inflammatory diets? I have a lot of itchiness associated with skin GVHD. Would anti-inflammatory diet help with that? So that's a really good question. So an anti-inflammatory diet is going to be primarily focused on a lot of the things we are talking about. So adding more fruits and vegetables to your diet and, you know, focusing on 
you know, kind of incorporating those natural sources of omega-3s, which have a natural, more anti-inflammatory profile. Now, I don't know if this will help with the skin rash, but it is overall a healthier diet. So if it doesn't necessarily help with the skin, it's going to potentially help in other ways that would hopefully lead to helping with the skin issue. Okay, I know you talked about the multivitamin, um, multivitamins, but someone wants to know, is it enough to eat fruits and vegetables or is a multivitamin recommended? They are two years after an allogeneic transplant and take steroids for GVHD. So in my opinion, if you have a very balanced diet, I don't think a multivitamin is necessary. If you're having issues like fatigue or um, feeling low on energy or maybe there's some malabsorption issues or the appetite has been kind of coming and going, then a multivitamin could be, could be beneficial. Um, it's good to just get clarification or approval from just the medical team so they know you're taking it. A multivitamin usually isn't going to cause any harm, but it's always good to like just keep that team involved and just let them know what's going on too. Okay, and someone would like to know if you have any recommendations for a vegetarian diet after transplant. I would um, kind of going back to what we talked about first in that grocery store tour, focusing on a lot of those plant-based proteins and having a variety of them. Um, you want to make sure as well that when you're planning your meals that you're planning for complete proteins. So what I mean complete proteins, certain food pairings like rice and beans are um, have been historically very popular because they give us all the essential amino acids that we need. Um, so you, you need to be a little bit savvy um, and knowledgeable, do a little bit of research just to make sure you're getting complete proteins on a vegetarian diet, but it is possible. And there are certain um, natural high plant-based proteins such as tofu. It has all the, is plant-based and has all the essential amino acids, but it's definitely possible uh, to stay on that vegetarian diet and have a healthy survivorship. And it's actually going to be beneficial in a lot of ways because it's going to help with that glucose metabolism and that cardiovascular health and potentially weight management as well. Someone is asking, if I am already on cholesterol medication, how would I know if I have metabolic syndrome? I would follow up with the doctor's office, and they would be able to tell you if you have metabolic syndrome. It um, involves a couple of more um, tests, such as looking at your hemoglobin A1C and doing a full lipid panel just to see what it looks like. Um, just because you have high cholesterol doesn't mean that we automatically have metabolic syndrome. So, you know, to be officially diagnosed with metabolic syndrome would require a little bit more testing. Is there a range of the number of eggs that is generally recommended in a week? Oh, you know, that's a good question. Um, I think it really depends on the person. You know, eggs, yes, they are, you know, healthy, and it does help to have those pasture-raised eggs that are going to have a little bit more of a healthier um, fatty a fatty acid profile, but they are still high in cholesterol, so you have to be mindful of that. So I would, you know, probably not exceed more than six to seven eggs in a week. Someone would like to know if you have any recommendations for books or websites that help with meal planning. Yes. So one of my favorite websites is the American Institute of Cancer Research. Um, all the sole purpose of this organization is to do research regarding nutrition and cancer. And they have great recipes for, you know, adding fruits and vegetables to your diet. Um, they have great educational materials and great meal planning tips as well. 
The next question is, I watched one of the earlier sessions and the infectious disease doctor stated that it is ideal to wait one year after transplant before eating raw fruits and vegetables. Do you have ideas of how to cook some of these fruits specifically so I can still get the benefits of them without eating them raw? So, oh, that's a good question. So uh, one thing to maybe um, consider or ask your, you know, um, care team is if it would be okay for you to have frozen uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, frozen fruits and vegetables are prepared in a more sterile environment, and sometimes they're even pasteurized during the freezing process, so they're going to have a lower um, bacteria risk. So I would check with your care team to see if they would be okay with you having frozen fruits and vegetables. But going back to your question of if you could cook them, of course you can cook them. Um, you know, one of the ways I really enjoy apples is, you know, baking them or even making um, homemade applesauce. And of course, if you're going to be um, buying fresh fruit, like fresh vegetables, and going to be making like a stir fry, I would just make sure you wash the vegetables very thoroughly with water and vinegar is what I recommend for my patients. And then cooking them will help reduce any bacteria risk as well. Would microwaving versus frying allow you to cook without raising the temperature to above the smoke point? I don't think so. I think microwaving might be a little bit riskier just because you won't be able to know what temperature it's at. Um, so like what I do is for my olive oil, I will either, you know, roast it, you know, at 325, go nice and slow, um, or I'll, I'll roast them at a higher temperature and then toss them with olive oil afterwards. Um, I use the oven a lot just because I can I know what temperature it's going to be at. Um, if I'm not sure, um, like I you know got a new stove, so I'm not sure what temperature you know it's cooking at really. Um, so I'll go on the safe side and use like my avocado oil or grapeseed oil if I'm going to be sautéing um, or doing like a sear on a chicken breast. Um, and I'll use a, something that has a higher smoke point just so I know what that temperature is going to be. If you want another option, actually, would be to get a thermometer and, and you can measure the temperature of the oil with a thermometer. The next question to ask, there are so many manifestations of GVHD that include overgrowth of yeast. I have a tendency to try to include sauerkraut, which is pasteurized, and yogurt. Is there any extra preparation or concerns about using these probiotic foods? In my opinion, no. I think they're perfectly okay to have. Again, you know, I would just make sure that your care team knows that you have those in your diet. Another option, if you haven't tried it, would be kefir. Um, kefir is also usually pasteurized and um, can be another good source of the probiotics. Do you have any specific recommendations for nutrition when being on small amounts of steroids? I think the most important thing is to make sure that the meals are balanced. Um, so what I mean by that is that, you know, you have, or I should say, like food pairing. So if you're going to have a snack, it shouldn't just be an apple by itself. You want to have that apple with like a piece of cheese or some peanut butter to help that protein and fat help buffer the sugar in the apple so it's not going to affect the sugar metabolism. So I think food pairing is really important on low-dose steroids. The second thing is I would recommend that um, we incorporate some sort of type of activity, um, both weight-bearing and such as light activity, such as walking. Um, one of my patients used to walk with weights, and so she'd kind of take care of two things with one stone, so to speak. Uh, but walking and exercise help improve your body's insulin sensitivity. So let me explain that just a little bit more briefly. So our pancreas makes insulin, and steroids tend to make us more insulin resistant. So that means our body doesn't use its own insulin very well. However, if we exercise, our body's insulin sensitivity improves because when we're moving, we're making our muscles hungry. And when our muscles are hungry, it helps move the sugar from our bloodstream into the muscles and helps keep it more in control. Are there any nutrients to help with peripheral neuropathy? 
I wish there were. There were some um, early studies regarding B vitamins um, to help with peripheral neuropathy, but there is not strong enough evidence um, for me to say anything confidently. I um, would just encourage a balanced, healthy diet. Someone would like to know how long, it, how long to be on a neutropenic diet. That's a good question and often a controversial one. Um, every institute is a little bit different. You know, I will tell you here, um, we recently transitioned from a neutropenic diet to a low microbial diet. So what that means is that our patients can have certain fruits and vegetables as long as they're triple washed, um, which they are in our cafeteria. And most of everything is on the list except berries. Berries we do recommend to be frozen. Um, but as far as the timeline, it really comes down to what is recommended by your care team. Uh, studies have shown that there's really um, there's no con there's no consensus on what's a good time frame. Um, so it's hard for me to answer that question. Every um, institute kind of does a little bit something different. I've seen 30 days. I've seen 100 days. I've seen a year. Um, so it really comes down to what is your care team's preference. And if your facility, um, you know, does have a dietitian, you know, kind of developing a relationship with her to see um, how she can help kind of liberalize that diet a little bit too. Okay, someone would like to know how a patient can balance a diet if they have osteoporosis and also prone to kidney stones. Those diets seem to oppose each other. They are correct. They do seem to oppose each other. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a balance, um, to say the least. So you want to make sure that you have those sources of, you know, the vitamin D, um, you know, remember vitamin D can come in multiple forms and calcium can come in multiple forms. And um, I would focus on probably the dairy, the non-dairy products compared to the dark green leafy vegetables because those have more oxalates and that can help, you know, um, or could play a role in that kidney stone formation. The other thing to keep in mind is, you know, different things work for different people. So it might be that we need to avoid, the, you know, altogether the fortified, you know, vitamin D and calcium non-dairy products and the dark green leafy vegetables, and maybe we need to focus on more weight-bearing activities to help with that bone health and prevent that osteoporosis. What type of diet would you recommend for the effects of weight gain from the steroids? I would start by, you know, um, keeping a food diary. Um, it's not fun, I'll be honest. It's quite tedious, but there are free apps like MyFitnessPal and Calorie Counter um, that you can track your calories for free. And that is seeing where, like, where our calories are coming from can be very eye-opening. A lot of times we have hidden calories and we don't realize it. So, you know, keeping a food diary can help see if we are over-consuming on um, our calorie intake or if we need to be more mindful of our distribution of calories. So maybe we have too many carbs in our diet versus too much protein. So I would start by keeping a food diary just so we can take a closer look to see where we're over consuming on certain things that are leading to the unintentional weight gain or preventing us from losing that weight that we want to lose. And then, of course, you know, not to be super repetitive, but incorporating exercise um, is so important for just overall health. And it doesn't have to be a lot. It can be 20 to 30 minutes a day, and it doesn't even have to be all at one time. It can be three 10-minute walks or two 10 walks. Um, but just doing some level of exercise will help keep your metabolism in a healthy state. What are your thoughts on using things like Beyond Meat versus Tofu, since both are processed, is one better than the other? 
Oh, good question. Um, so I don't, I don't mind the Beyond Meat. Um, I've tried it, um, and I've also tried Impossible Meat, and I like tofu. They're all good. Um, and they're all not bad. Now, anything can be bad if, if, if it's overdone. Tofu and soy kind of get a bad reputation, and it really shouldn't because there's a lot of good benefits around tofu. It is a phytoestrogen, and so which means that it's a plant estrogen, which can sometimes cause concern, especially with my breast cancer patients. But studies have shown that moderate intakes are perfectly safe. So I would say both are good. It just depends on what you're going to be cooking it with. I'll be honest to you, I've tried the Beyond Meatballs where I was I liked, actually. Those were really good. But when I tried the ground meat products, it the texture, I couldn't do it. The texture just, you know, didn't agree with me. Um, it wasn't something I enjoyed. Um, same thing with tofu. I really enjoy tofu in my pad thai um, and when I have a miso soup. Uh, so I think all are all are good in the right amount of portions. Someone would like to know: Is it okay to drink wine moderately daily? Oh, that's a good question. So, uh, the American Institute of Cancer Research, you know, the website I mentioned earlier, and both the American Cancer Society do recommend that we minimize our alcohol intake or limit it. Now, I say minimize and limit. I did not say avoid. So, I think daily might be a little much. You know, uh, they do recommend zero to one drink per day for women and one to two drinks um, for men, which I know that's a little frustrating because what does zero to one mean? Um, so I would say um, a couple of glasses of wine a day, I'm sorry, not a day, a week would be within re reason. I don't think daily alcohol intake is necessarily the healthiest choice for us. Now, something to consider is doing a mocktail. And so there are tons of mocktail recipes out there, and a lot of the times um, that can help kind of satisfy that um, behavior of wanting that kind of, you know, adult beverage, but without that alcohol content. Okay, we are running out of time, so this is going to have to be our last question. But someone would like to know what you meant by food pairing while on steroids. Okay, sorry, let me clarify. So food pairing, what I mean by that is when you want you want a carbohydrate with a protein. So this is cheese and crackers, eggs and toast, um, fruit with cheese or fruits with nuts. Uh, so the fruit and the crackers um, and the toast being the carbohydrates your cheese or your nuts being, or the egg being the protein. So when you have the protein paired with the carb, it helps slow the, it helps control the absorption of the sugar. So that way it doesn't hit your blood system all at one time. It helps slow down the digestion in a much more controlled manner. Thank you so much. Dr. Stubbins, for all of this wonderful information. On behalf of BMT InfoNet and our partners, we'd like to thank you and for you, Dr. Stubbins, for your helpful remarks, and thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. Please contact BMT InfoNet if we can help you in any way. Enjoy the rest of the symposium.